Okay, so $800 of FBS to create one kilogram of meat. Mm -hmm. And for you guys, it's approximately $10. Yeah, this is what we say. Hey everyone, I hope you're doing well today. In this video, I want to talk about the company Beeftek. They're a Turkish company who is also based in the United States, and they are making fetal bovine serum replacement, and it is going to drastically reduce the costs and help enable companies to actually sell cultivated meat. Now, in this video, I want to go through a number of talks. One is with Dr. Ardem Ilucci. He is the Chief Technology Officer at BTEC. And the other is with Dr. John Akjali. He is the Chief Scientific Officer at BTEC. We're going to be going through everything from what the costs are, how they get their cost reductions, what the market looks like for their business, some of the companies they're selling to, and also get into some of the more technical aspects of what exactly their product is. I'm talking about them, A, because they are a portfolio company of Cult Food Science, but B, because I've now spent about a week looking into the technology and I understand a bit better why they might have been invested in in the first place. Let's get into that video. Um, where are you, how are you... How did you guys sort of come up with the, the approach that you're using today? Um, and where, how far away are you from proving your method is, is, a, is a strong alternative to fetal bovine serum or FBS? Mm -hmm. Well, um, we had some experience, as I said. Um, so we were already screening, um, screening micro, micro, mi microbiomes. Their um, metabolites and their the effect of those metabolites on cells, and we um, have been screening also some plant-based solutions, and then we realized that the super supernatants that we obtained from from the from the microbiome of different animals can sustain um, sustain living in um, cell cultures and can also induce them, induce the cells to proliferate. Um, so we have some candidates, very promising candidates, that secrete high amounts of those um, growth-inducing factors um, to, the, to the environment that they grow in. And we have tried to on primary cells as well as um, cell lines, and we saw some, some, some growths. Um, and it can compete with the FPS. I mean, the data that we have shows us that the growth factors on all the, I mean, the metabolites that is secreted from bacteria can um, induce the cell growth as much as FPS does. Um, so, so, it's, so it's as effective as FPS? It is, yes. Um, so far, this is what we have seen. Um, we are trying it on in, in different 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 conditions, um, like in in 3D, in bioreactors, in higher quantities, um, in, in in different mediums. I mean, different different environments. So far, we have tested it on plastic dishes, which is a t to, to the to the environment. Um, but we are trying to optimize it for 3D. Um, not only in bioreactors, but also in some, some so, sodium alginate um, kind of environments that provide 3D environment to, to, to cells. Um, so be, cells behave differently depending on the, on, on the way they attach to the neighboring, neighboring cells. So their, their response can be, can, can, can be a bit different. Um, and so the concentration of the of the of the supplement that we use, um, the type of the supplement that we use might be changing. That's why lots of optimization studies is required. So this is what we are doing. I think it's really important here just to stop and say that with cell cultures, just because you can grow some cells in a petri dish on a flat surface doesn't mean you can scale that solution up to growing in a bioreactor. So if you need to grow millions in cells and actually B 
be able to sell cultured meat at a reduced cost, then we need to be able to get the solution to work in a bioreactor. And so this is why we're testing all of these different options. So this is what 2D means. 2D means just growing cells on a flat plane. And 3D means actually taking a full bioreactor, like if you had this bottle and you had a bunch of cells inside there, they're all suspended. And the liquid that they're suspended in would contain some of this serum and so we want it to work within something like this okay so there was a lot in there but uh so from a efficacy or, or sort of impact or usefulness perspective your approach is you've you've been able to prove so far that your approach is as is you as efficacious or as useful as fetal bovine serum right um, the other, so as far as usefulness is concerned, you're, you're proving that your your approach is is you know works and has the impact it needs. What about from a cost perspective? You mentioned that fetal bovine serum was expensive. It was one of the reasons why it it was sort of slowing down the development of the clean meat category. Um, how does how does the cost of your approach compare? Sure. Um, so the um, the cost of our approach involves isolation of the bacteria, so which is uh, quite cheap, and um, the, the 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 medium that the bacteria is supposed to live in, because so the bacteria also needs a specific growth medium, which is by the way animal product free. It contains um, yeast extracts, some vitamins and minerals. So there is no animal um, ingredients in, in this medium. Um, and um, site costs, like electricity, water, um, you know, labor costs, whatever. And when we sum them all up, um, we come up with a price like $10, liter, $10 per kilogram of, of, of meat. But, you know, this is kind of um, calculated by making some approaches. Um, so we have not, you know, designed a, a huge scaled up uh, factor for it yet. Um, but this is what we guess. It's going to be like it, um, the cost of this supplement going to be like ten dollars per kilogram of meat. So ten. So your current estimates ten dollars per kilogram of meat. How does that compare, for example, to FBS? I don't know what that the price of that is. Yeah, as long as I know. Um, Seven liters of um, seven liters of, for example, um, DMEM, which is a um, growth medium, is used per kilogram of of meat production. It could be seven to up to twenty, as long as I um, remember. And um, the dilution of the FPS should be like ten percent at least, sometimes twenty percent. So um, let's say ten liters of um, DMEM is used per um, per kilogram of meat production. Therefore, twenty percent of dilution means uh, ten liters, two two liters of FPS, right? So, so twenty percent of the total whole um, growth medium should be FPS. So, for ten liters of growth medium, two liters should be FPS. Half liter of FPS costs two hundred dollars. Therefore, four of that bottle gonna be used, which makes eight hundred dollars. So, I mean, so basically, dollars versus ten dollars. <laughs> okay, so eight hundred dollars of FBS to create one kilogram of meat, mm -hmm. and for you guys, it's approximately ten dollars. Yeah, this is what we say. This is what this is how we guess. I mean, according to our calculations, we haven't practiced it yet. Um, but so this is what we um, foresee. Let's say he's right. So ten dollars a kilogram is roughly five dollars a pound. When Justin Kolbeck in the last video talked about now most companies are seeing sub one hundred dollars a pound, I would think that. Based on the $800 that FBS costs, 
I would think that the sub $100 a pound, that's about $50 a kilogram, I would guess that that is now already taking into account not using fetal bovine serum. So I think you're going to probably see in the news for the next forever, <laughs> lots of news articles talking about, oh, cultured meat's bad because fetal bovine serum is bad, and it is. But I don't see a world where any company is going to market with fetal bovine serum. You know, he just has in Singapore for their very first product, but Singapore is a small market. And by the time we actually come to the US and come to Europe and actually legalize this in other countries, fetal bovine serum is not going to be used anymore. It makes zero economic sense and you can't market it to consumers. In terms of the sub $100 a pound quote, I think that we've already reduced the costs from multi thousands of dollars to sub $100 by taking out fetal bovine serum, getting from that sub $100 to the $12 wholesale price point. Good Food Institute is talking about having a production cost of just over $2 in 2030. That's the production cost. The $12 is the wholesale cost or the cost to the consumer, which is being quoted as 2030. So we're kind of going from $100 to two dollars in production costs some of that will come from further optimization in these replacements for fetal bovine serum but i think a lot of it is going to come from just better bioreactor design scaling up factories and actually producing cultivated meat at scale okay let's assume it's half that just I'm um, you know thinking of a number half that still significantly different uh, and potentially from my point of view opens up the whole clean meat uh, category part of the challenge has been with clean meat or cell based meat um, has been uh, the ability to the cost of of the growth factor which is obviously something you need to factor in or, or include uh, when determining the the scalability and the second is the the tech uh, the bioreactor constraints uh, at size, right? These things are these bioreactors are quite expensive. Um, sounds like you guys have potentially solved one of the toughest uh, challenges in the in the clean meat space or the cell based meat space. You've said that these are calculations; they're your estimates. How long will it be until you can actually? know your absolute cost saving and you said you've already proven the efficacy of your product versus fbs so that i guess was the first step the second step is uh, i would imagine is being able to prove the volume required and therefore the costs the specific cost versus fbs is that a is that a one month from today uh, uh, is that something that's going to take about a month to solve? Is that something that's going to take about a year to solve so that you understand the, the kind of cost structure? How long is that from your point of view going to take? Mm -hmm. Well, um, so according to the timeline um, that we aim, let's say, um, it will take a year. Um, so I say a year because in molecular biology world, if you made a calculation um, like I, I, I can finish this project in three years, you have to triplicate it because, you know, there are lots of things that may go wrong. Um, that's why I say one year. In one year, we can know all. Um, we are looking for, for uh, design, different designs of bioreactors, the one that fits um, best to us. Uh, we are going to make a purchase um, soon, um, I think in a, in a month. We can buy the bioreactor, then we will going. Uh, we are going to um, start the experiments to 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 know. I mean the the exact numbers. Um, so we will make um, probably at least ten sessions of um, um, sessions of of, of um, incubation. So which will, which may take a um, couple of months. Um, so we, we may need to change the design and um, try or repeat everything um, from the scratch. So in a one year time, I think we can know the exact numbers. Mm -hmm. Perfect. How long? One year. One year. Okay. Um, let's talk about 
the business a little bit. Uh, it's going to take you a year, you mentioned, to be able to show the cost is is potentially 80 times or 40 times less expensive than FBS. Who do you see buying your growth factor? Um, and when do you think it will be available for sale? So, um, there are many companies who are interested. Um, we, had, we, we, we already had lots of letters of intentions. Um, once we are ready, um, so there are companies who are willing to buy. I mean, just um, at the time that we declare we are ready to sell. Um, so those companies are like, um, I mean, if um, I mean, if there is no concern regarding making advertisements, I can tell their names. Um, no, no, no. <laughs> no, I mean. I we're interested in understanding, you know, what kind of, where's the business here? Uh, you know, you, you, you're, you're developing a growth factor which will be used to create cell-based meat, clean meat. Um, it's part of the reason why the industry has had, cha not challenges, but part of the reason why it's taking time to uh, grow is because the component parts, including the growth factor, are expensive, right? If you guys have figured out a way of taking the expense out of that process, uh, it unlocks the whole category, it unlocks the whole industry. What kind of companies will, do you see as being your first potential customers? And, and by all means, mention them. If, if, they're, if you think they'll be comfortable with it and they'll be fine with it, then by all means, mention them. Hmm. All right. So the companies who are, who are intending to produce the end product, the meat, um, could be the buyers. Um, last week, for example, I had a conversation with a German-based um, company who are intending to produce Schnitzel A Life. Um, so they are all, they're they're intending to buy the technology, um, maybe the serum itself, but they are kind of interested in the technology. They um, want us to demonstrate that our serum works. If it works, then um, so uh, we will, we are going to be, we can be their supply, suppliers, so we can have an agreement. Um, so we are in commerce, we are in discussion with many companies from Singapore. So they are quite interested. Um, they are all looking for um, and why, solutions. And why Singapore in particular? So they're, they're, they're very eager to to ha be, being a hub in the world so i mean a hub in terms of cultivated meat production so you know singapore is the pioneer in um in um, um in terms of allowing the production of it i just read the news today um so it is going to be the scaled up i mean the um, the, the small scale production of just go gonna be bigger in the following months. Um, so Singapore has allowed them to make this um, scaling up. Then we had conversation with companies in um, other European countries. Mm -hmm. uh, one from England, one from Belgium. So. So, I mean, as you may guess, um, so the, those companies, I mean, the potential buyers are the peop are the companies that are intending to produce stand products. So they don't want to solve all the problems, um, but they are mostly looking for solutions um, from, you know, other providers. Okay. Okay. So various companies in Singapore, some in Europe, um, are these are these meat companies or are these companies uh, like do you see for example that the traditional meat companies are starting to take an interest in cell based or clean meat um, or, or is it more sort of early stage companies who are developing the technology mm -hmm. um, so both both is available so early stage startups as well as advanced startups um, are in contact with us. They are quite interested in, in our solution. Um, for example, the, the companies in Singapore are most intending to produce fish. Um, but the, the German-based company 
is intending to produce Chinese cells. So they are considering their so the um, cultural, the cultural local cuisine. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Okay. Um, you've mentioned that you guys are basically eating a lot of uh, uh, ramen noodles and you're not paying yourself for the first two years. Uh, you took your grant money and you turned it into test tubes and uh, Bunsen burners and the microscope, not forgetting the microscope. Um, when do you, as a team, believe that this is going to be a business where you can sell product, create revenue and actually, you know, not rely upon grants or investment as a way of building the business? And, 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 you know, maybe it's five years from now, I don't know, but what do you guys estimate and what, what, what gives you a belief that that's the time period for, for, for you know, turning this into a, a revenue generating business versus a grant or a, uh, an investment business? Mm -hmm. Well, so as you see positive data, <laughs> so we are encouraged. Um, but when it's going to be, you know, um, revenue generating company. So, um, well, it depends on, it depends on, of course, the buyers. So when, it, when, so when the buyers are ready to produce, so we are supposed to be ready to, to, to sell, right? Um, it also depends on the regulations. So um, before regulations, so meat producers can wouldn't like to would like to invest on buying the serum, right? So it depends on lots of lots of parameters. But it is worth to mention that um, since we are interested in so microbiomes and uh, um, the, the the metabolites of um, um, bacteria, there are some other potential products that we are also considering. Um, like, for example, postbiotics um, that is that that can be ingrained in a toothpaste, or um, postbiotics or bacteria that prevents um, the decay of of meat um, that could be, you know, um, inoculated within the packaging. So we are also planning to initiate some 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 research and development um, projects that are constantly constantly on 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 those those aspects. Um, even even if the clean meat space is not ready, for example, in terms of regulations, um, or um, you know it might not have been scaled up yet, so we could still um, generate some some revenue. On the other hand. If we can grow cells without FPS, our our solution could be could be could be sold to um, research groups I mean to academia because academia is also dependent on um, on FPS I mean regular cell culture um, laboratories are dependent on FPS mm -hmm. um, so research group might also be interested in those alternatives so. Although we are kind of, um, you know, kind of dependent on the climate, climate sector, we could be somehow find a, you know, um, a backup plan to, to generate some, some revenue um, before everything um, is in the market. I think this part is really important for investors to understand because let's just say that cultured meat doesn't ever become cost effective. And let's just say regulations don't work. Like one of the big risks is it just, it doesn't happen. One of the good things about beef tech is that this technology can apply, be applied to a lot of other solutions. For example, in medical research, for cancer research, for example, you need to culture cells as well. Currently in medical research, we also use fetal bovine serum. It's not just something that people are talking about because of food. This is using medical research. Regardless of whether food works or not, we still need this product because we should be veganizing medical research as well, shouldn't we? Um, for point of perspective, 
when the the regulatory environment is there in other words when you're when people are allowed to sell sell uh, you know cl clean meat or cell based meat as a product and people can go into a store and and buy it or have it as an ingredient within a product um how are there estimates in your market for how big the cell based or the clean meat market could be is it a a billion dot is it you know in the next five years a billion dollar market is it a, a multi-billion dollar market is it more likely to be 10 years what uh, what uh well i guess there's two ways of looking at that what is what are the sort of the estimates that you've seen or you've read about and what do you personally think the the mm -hmm. is is the potential size of the of the cell based or clean meat market over the next you know five to ten years yeah um so there's a magic number like five <laughs> and mostly when this when this question is asked um the, the the answer is like in five years it's going to be like more than 50 percent um but uh, there are there are reports um that says by 2030 um so if i am not wrong if i am co remembering correctly 30 percent of the meat going to be clean meat both plant-based and also cultivated meat 70 percent going to be conventional beginning from 2030 um so by 2040 and 50 more than half gonna be clean meat uh, in my opinion it's going to be even earlier let me give you um, give you an example for example the plant-based um, um plant-based meat is still you know occupies less than 10 percent of the of the market right mm -hmm. um so correct me if i am wrong but it is already available in 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 fast food chain restaurants in turkey a couple of days ago i ordered burger king whooper which is plant made of um, plant-based um, burger patty and um, it was it was at pilot stage uh, in the burger king in, in turkey like a couple of months ago i mean things are going so fast um so i saw the first i tasted the first burger patty of impossible burger two years ago but now i am consuming it already and it has been two years only and the estimates were like in five years it's going to be all world, world all, i mean all around the world but it has been two years so um thing it it, it it looks like things are going faster than we estimate and my personal guess is once the regulations um regulatory space is is um is all done ready and uh, um so companies are um you know ready to produce and sell it so it could happen in a, in a, in a year um maximum in two years we are going to see it in the restaurants in my opinion even even in, in countries like um turkey so, so, I mean, so it's not going to take long two to three years you think cell based meat will be in restaurants yeah this is what what i guess mm -hmm. and and from your point of view uh where's going to be the obviously singapore has deregulated it allows cell based meat to be sold and consumed today they go, they went through the analysis the scientists have taken a look at it and they believe that there's no risk and this is a product that can be sold and when you think about it because it's at the it, at the molecular level or the cell level it's identical to traditional meat i don't know why you would actually need to regulate or, or 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 have a concern about the product uh obviously we can get into that if there's a reason but um aside from singapore where do you where do you think the that will be the first sort of countries or regions that will be part of this shift over the next in your opinion two two or three years uh as usual in my opinion after singapore um california going, gonna be the first um okay. spot on the world yeah california then it be um in all all around USA, uh, but in the meantime, Europe, um, probably Holland first, um, going to be selling the product, then England, 
Um, once it is in once it is in Europe, um, um, it so it will penetrate to to Middle East easily. Um, so the pioneer going gonna be California, then Europe will follow, in my opinion. So I mean, it is always like like that, right? In terms of new technologies, so. First, it pops up in California, then migrates to Europe, and then Middle East. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So. Okay. Uh, and, and and if it's if, if it is available more pervasively over the next couple of years, um, have you heard, have you sort of got a feel for size of market over the next two to three years or four years? Is this a you know is this a billion dollar opportunity? Should other companies be taking this very seriously or is it still very much a sort of a rare it'll be in a few places in california it'll be in a few places in uh you know holland and other places what what size of market any any view well um so i can't make a precise estimation but i believe it's going to be a be it's going to be a billion dollar market um I am sure that today's conventional meat producers gonna see a big opportunity there. I mean, uh, the meat producers in Turkey are having discussions. It's going to be fascinating to see how all of this plays out. Okay, in the next part of this video, I want to get into more of the technical discussions and look at what exactly is their product and how are they making this replacement for fetal bovine serum and how does their product actually compare data wise to fetal bovine serum let's look at that so our growth medium supplement is based on our microorganism i'm going to uh, i'm going to explain a little bit later it is 100 percent animal independent uh, gmo free and it costs very, very, very little fraction of what the FPS costs, actually. When you look at this, uh, the microbes on Earth is 100 times, 100 million times as many as than the stars that is uh, in the universe. So therefore, we don't need to look for different uh, specific fancy things, but it is the microbiology which is there waiting there for this. It's the ultimate big data science which we can use for our purpose. This is what we, are, what we have taught when we start this uh, process. Now, you may not be uh, familiar with the microorganisms or the, their products. Actually, you may probably heard probiotics everywhere in the market because probiotics is um, it is the lactic acid bacteria. There is the there is the bacteria there, which is which is uh, uh, which is the which is uh, which may, which is contributed to lots of different kind of food in the in the uh, in the markets you can purchase. But what we are actually using is the postbiotics that you see on the on the right hand side. So it is the metabolic byproduct of the, uh, the from the probiotics. So we don't use. There is no live cells, there is no live microorganism for this. It's only the metabolic byproducts of these, um, <clears throat> of these microorganisms. The, there is lots of sources for microbiota, and you can, we, we use it for the cow that we obtain from the milk, I'm going to show you, but you can get it from the chicken or the fish, which we already have these microbiota from different species also, which you can say, which, which you can use it for different kind of uh, cultivated meat, both fish and uh, chicken. And actually, this is not a new area for the science. Uh, it has been, this postbiotics have been used, different postbiotics have been used in the research in many different kind of uh, many different kind of conditions. And also, it has been recently shown, actually, two, 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 not recently, but three years ago, it has been a very important role in the muscle metabolism, um, uh, in the, for, the, for the muscle fiber, for function of the muscle fiber. So, uh, so we came from the microbe organism, and we, we tried to connect these uh, postbiotic, the products of these post microorganisms into the muscle itself, which we, we are required to develop the proliferate. This is our, how we do this, uh, this thing. So we get the you know, bacteria from, in this case, from the milk <coughs> microbiota collect, collection, and we isolate, identify the, identify the bacteria, then produce this bacteria in the large volumes, and then isolate these postbiotics from this. Uh, each 
bacterial strain, which then you can get lyophilized and you can use it as a powder form and then combine. This is which we, our application for the patent. And then you can actually combine with the culture medium and then do whatever you do for the conventional, uh, conventional uh, muscle cell growth and then uh, compare it with the fertile bovine serum. This is what we did and I am going to show you a little bit uh, data for this. So this is what we have done with the primary bovine serum and as you see uh, on the x-axis you see the different postbiotics and on the y-axis, the, the MTT results, or the cell proliferation, or the metabolism. And what you have seen is actually, with the fertile wine serum, some of them are, um, some of them are giving the almost similar to the fertile bovine serum, the medium with the fertile bovine serum, and some of them are even give significantly higher uh, results for the, uh, compared to the fertile bovine serum. Now, this is, um, uh, these are different days, uh, different di the t time periods that we have performed this experiment, and some of these we have more than 300 different postbiotics, and eight of them are actually uh, useful for the cell proliferation that we test in the uh, in the <coughs> in the um, uh, metabolite com uh, comp and then compare it. When we say uh, the one that you see in the right in the for your right in the uh, second one in the right is actually the combination of the, these are two best for, uh, postbiotics, and then I am going to explain you in a minute. We explain, uh, we combine it a very minute amount of IGF and FGF, which we see a huge, uh, uh, significant increase compared to the FPS alone in the medium, which you see in the left um, uh, left of the panel in the, in this slide. Okay, so there's a lot there. Essentially, to sum it up, we have probiotics, which are like, for example, if you take milk, you ferment it into yogurt, you get lactic acid and some other microbes, which essentially make up probiotics. And then those are living organisms which produce waste. And the waste products are a bunch of vitamins and minerals and other organisms which are called postbiotics. And so those, we'll get into which they are in a sec, can be used to feed cell growth and to help culture cells. What Beef Tech has done and what they're showing here is that they've identified individual postbiotics that they can use. And so they're showing the data on, you know, which ones are actually as efficient or more efficient than the equivalent fetal bovine serum for culturing cells. And they've also shown combinations of those probiotics, which ones are just as efficient, if not more efficient, then field bovine serum. There are seven different postbiotics from the bioactive components produced by the, these beneficial bacteria. And in our uh, list, we use out of these seven, we use these uh, five of these factors. So we, we know what are the factors that are, have effect on these on the growth fact on the on the growth of these muscle cells. Why beef tech? Why not a bunch of these other companies that are making serum-free medium for a replacement to fetal bovine serum. What's the difference between these companies and Beef Tech? Now, I'm gonna show you a clip from another talk, but I do think it's illustrative of what some of the differences are and potentially how this can further drive down cost of the cell culture medium. So there are other companies also in, in this area that we are uh, in this generating of the uh, generation of this culture media supplement. However, we are different from the other ones in two ways. One of them is we, we are natural. Uh, we don't use genetically engineered methods in order to produce growth factors. So therefore, it is very cost effective and natural. And we, this is our difference in terms of uh, when, when we compare to the other company. Of course, we could go way deeper into the technical aspects but I think that's enough for one video and we'll see you in the next video.